नमस्कार दिस इज फर्स्ट पोस्ट एंड यू वॉचिंग वैंटेज विद मी पलकी शर्मा The Friday blockbuster is Donald Trump. He's been indicted. He'll be charged. The first former president of America to be criminally charged. What will it mean for his presidential bid? We'll discuss that. Meanwhile, the war in Ukraine has a new entrant, North Korea. Apparently, North Korea is giving military supplies to Moscow in exchange for food. As NATO tanks roll into Ukraine, NATO members are coming closer to Russia's borders. Finland is on course to join. Turkey, the last hurdle has been cleared. We'll talk about Erdogan's power games here. As he agrees to NATO expansion, he is also getting ready to host Putin next month. The Vatican has apologized for legitimizing Europe's colonial powers. And Chad GPT questioned Japan's Prime Minister in Parliament. We'll bring you all these stories and more. There's a lot of ground to cover. The headlines first. The chip war with China escalates. Japan announces a plan to curb exports of chip making equipment. Beijing slams the move as Tokyo tows Washington's line. Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko calls for a truce in Ukraine. One of Putin's closest allies urges talks between Moscow and Kiev, quote unquote, without preconditions. Lukashenko blames the West for increasing the likelihood of a nuclear war. Is North Korea executing its teenagers for watching South Korean TV shows like K-dramas? Yes, says a report from Seoul's Unification Ministry. South Korea claims the report is based on testimonies of defectors from the North. Layoffs hit billionaire Richard Branson's Virgin Orbit. The rocket company sacks 85% of its staff. Virgin Orbit is winding down its operations after failing to secure funds to keep it afloat. South African Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius seeks early release from prison. The Blade Runner is serving a 13-year sentence for killing his girlfriend in 2013. And Gwyneth Paltrow wins her court battle in the ski crash case of 2016. The jury rules that she did not cause the collision. Awards her one dollar in damages. NATO has finally entered the Ukraine battlefield. No, it's not sending troops yet, but NATO tanks are rolling into Ukraine. The deliveries have begun, plus NATO is inching closer to the Russian border. It is expanding. Finland is set to join the alliance. The decks have been cleared, and this only means that the challenges for Russia are mounting. And it's happening with the onset of spring. Perfect timing for Ukraine to launch an offensive. How is Russia gearing up to respond to this? It is replenishing its own arsenal and stitching more defense partnerships. The latest one in the picture is North Korea. Russia is getting defense supplies from North Korea. That's what the Americans say. That Moscow will give food to Pyongyang in exchange for weapons. The deal, if it happens, will be a violation of UN resolutions. But we're way past that. Way past following rules here. The West tried to corner Russia with sanctions. Russia has got a veto power plus diplomatic cover from China, and now its goal is to turn this advantage into territorial gains. So, who has the upper hand in the war? Let's start with the latest. After weeks of waiting, Ukraine is finally getting the tanks it wanted: the Leopard tanks from Germany and the Challenger tanks from Britain. The UK is sending a total of 14 tanks. Germany has shared 18. We stand by Ukraine, which we support politically, financially, but also with arms deliveries and especially with the military training that both our countries provide. Germany and the Netherlands have jointly delivered armored infantry fighting vehicles and ammunition, and are currently preparing, together with Denmark, the delivery of Leopard 1 main battle tanks. Very modern tanks, he says. Germany was initially reluctant, but under pressure from U.S. and allies, it relented and agreed to share tanks with Ukraine. Earlier, Norway had sent eight tanks. What about the U.S.? It hasn't made any deliveries yet. Last week, the U.S. promised to speed up. In close coordination with Ukraine, has made the decision to provide the M1A1 variant of the Abrams tank, which will enable us to significantly expedite delivery timelines. 
and deliver this important capability to Ukraine by the fall of this year. It will also give Ukraine a very similar capability to the M1A2, which includes advanced armor and weapon systems to include a 120 millimeter cannon and 50 caliber heavy machine gun. How many tanks will America give Ukraine? Reports say at least 31. And how many tanks will Ukraine get in total? Kiev is expecting at least 120 tanks in the first wave. And how will it use them in combat missions? Ukraine says they'll begin very soon. The tanks will boost its defenses and the morale of its troops. Before sending them to the front lines, Ukraine's defense minister took the tanks out for a spin. He released these videos showing off the NATO tanks. If social media posts could win a war, Ukraine would have bagged it by now. But that's not how it works. And unfortunately for Ukraine, Russia is intensifying the attacks. There's no breakthrough in Bakhmut yet. Today, Russia targeted Kharkiv in the northeast. Russian forces unleashed drone and missile strikes. Civilian infrastructure was targeted. Reports say Russia launched the missiles from the S-300. Also, Iranian drones were in the sky. And what is Zelensky doing? He's giving interviews. This week, he spoke to the Associated Press. Ukraine's president was asked about Bakhmut. This is a city in the east where Ukrainians and Russians have been fighting for months. Many lives have been lost, but neither side is ready to give up. Zelensky says he won't allow Putin a win on the battlefield. Is this part of why you are fighting so hard in Bakhmut? Because a lot of military analysts will say that strategically, it's not that significant. Because that will be victory for him. He will and s any victory. Yes, he will sell this victory. He will sell this victory to West, to his society, to China, to Iran, to all the countries. That is Zelensky's fear. He claims Putin will use a win in Bakhmut as leverage and push for a deal. A deal that will heavily favor the Russians. But Washington has a different assessment. It says Putin is not preparing for a negotiation. He's ramping up his military supplies. The U.S. says Russia is sending a delegation to North Korea. They will offer food to the North Koreans, and in return, they'll get weapons. In fact, let me quote from what the White House has said. As part of this proposed deal, Russia would receive over two dozen kinds of weapons and munitions from Pyongyang. We also understand that Russia is seeking to send a delegation to North Korea and that Russia is offering North Korea food in exchange for munitions. The idea is not far-fetched. But remember, the West made similar claims about China too, that China will arm the Russians. That hasn't happened yet. So far, Beijing has only supplied dual-use equipment to Moscow. Dual use are goods that are meant for civilian use, but can also be repurposed by the military. The Chinese have not sent any lethal arms yet. This month, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited Russia. He presented his much hyped peace plan. Putin supported it. The West rejected it. What about Ukraine? Zelensky did say that he wants to talk to Xi Jinping. And they were supposed to talk to each other, but it hasn't happened yet. Zelensky is still waiting for the phone to ring. Of course, I gave all the diplomatic and public and not public to president of China, uh, to, yeah, to leader of China, and I want to speak with him because I, have con I had contact with him before full-scale war. Meanwhile, China's defense ministry says it's looking to increase military cooperation with Russia. The statement came yesterday. China said it would join hands with Russia to promote world peace. And I'm not making this up. The statement made no mention of military supplies. Either way, Beijing is firmly in Moscow's camp. It has been backing Russia in a steady yet limited fashion. And despite Xi Jinping's desire to be seen as peacemaker, there is no peace in sight. The war has completed 401 days, and both sides are adding to their arsenal to continue fighting. Meanwhile, celebrations are on in Finland, the country is set to become the latest NATO member. NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Alliance, a military alliance that is led by the U.S. Finland had been trying to join for months, and finally it can. That's because Turkey has given the green light. It was the last hurdle. NATO has 30 members, including Turkey, and all members must agree before a new country is allowed to join. So the decks have been cleared for Finland to join. It will formally be inducted in the next NATO meeting. That's in July this year. But remember, Finland was not the only country that wanted to join NATO. 
Sweden applied too at the same time. Both these Nordic countries, Finland and Sweden, have been traditionally neutral. But they decided to join the NATO camp after Russia invaded Ukraine last year. This is what some Finns had to say. Well, I believe that uh, in, in this kind of uh, environment, political environment nowadays, I believe that uh, um, there is uh, definitely uh, a strength in, in numbers and, and, and there is a good uh, opportunity now that uh, we can all be uh, united under this uh, NATO banner and, uh, and, uh, and uh, no longer maybe uh, be uh, under any kind of uh, threats. I think it would be good. I mean, we get more international connections and it could really help Finland if Russia would decide to do something, for example. It could be really good for Finland. Both Finland and Sweden decided to seek NATO protection against possible Russian aggression. Because NATO has a rule. An attack on one member is an attack on all. So NATO is like a security insurance. And membership would prevent a Ukraine-like situation where the West can help, but only indirectly. So these countries, Finland and Sweden, wanted to join, but they faced two roadblocks, Hungary and Turkey. Both have leaders that the West considers problematic. Hungary's Viktor Orban and Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And Erdogan, in particular, has been using the Nordic countries as political pawns. He blocked their entry to the NATO. Why would Erdogan do this? He's been in power for two decades using authoritarian tactics. He started as prime minister of Turkey in 2004, then became president in 2014. In 2018, he abolished the position of prime minister and became president again. He's basically been making changes to Turkey's government to extend his reign. And that's just one of the problems that Western democracies have with him. Then there are his ties to Moscow. Russian President Vladimir Putin shares good relations with Erdogan. This is despite the war in Ukraine. Just yesterday, Erdogan said Putin could visit Turkey next month. This is to inaugurate the country's first nuclear power reactor. The reactor was built by a Russian energy company and Putin may inaugurate it. Erdogan has also refused to back Western sanctions on Moscow. In fact, Turkey has been helping Russia evade those very same sanctions. Then they went ahead and bought the Russian S-400 missile defense systems. This led to a lot of heartburn in NATO, a NATO member buying Russian defense equipment. The U.S. sanctioned Turkey for this, but Erdogan did not budge. And the Russian S-400s have been arriving in Turkey since 2019. So there's a lot of tension, really, between Turkey and its NATO allies. Then why is the West still listening to Erdogan? Why can't they just boot Turkey out of NATO? Because like most other things, it's complicated. Turkey joined NATO in 1952, just three years after the alliance was formed. It has been a steady partner over the years. Even today, Turkish drones are helping Ukraine in the war. Turkey also has the manpower that NATO needs. Its armed forces are the second largest in NATO. France comes third, and Turkey is said to have more than double the troops of France. American forces make up the bulk of NATO troops, but Turkey is also essential. And Erdogan knows all of this, which is why he continues to play his politics. He blocked the entry of Nordic nations, saying they allow anti-Turkey activities both Sweden and Finland. They have Turkish dissidents and Kurds who want to break away from Turkey. Erdogan calls them terrorists. Some of these groups are also part of an attempted coup in Turkey in 2016. Basically, Recep Tayyip Erdogan has an axe to grind with these people. He says Sweden should deport them. Only then will he allow Sweden to join NATO. He had similar issues with Finland too, but apparently they have been resolved. Erdogan praised what he called Finland's authentic and concrete steps on Turkish security. And that's why the Turkish parliament ratified Finland's membership yesterday. The approval of the protocol for ratification of Finland to join NATO as follows. Vote 276, approved 276. As the parliament of Turkey, we congratulate the state and the people of Finland. The bill proposed was approved. Erdogan's politics aside, Finland joining NATO is a blow to Putin. For years, he's used military intervention to destabilize neighbors who wanted to join NATO, like Georgia in 2008 and Ukraine, 
from 2014 till date. So Erdogan's green light to Finland will definitely upset Moscow. But he's doing a balancing act. He's looking after his own interests, essentially. After all, he has an election to face in less than two months. A few days ago, deep fakes of Donald Trump went viral. They visualized the potential arrest of Trump. They showed Trump running away from the cops, Trump in an orange jumpsuit, sitting alone behind bars inside a federal prison. Those pictures were all fake. But reality is inching closer to what they showed. Donald Trump has been indicted. He's been criminally charged. And this is a first. Never before has a former president of America faced criminal charges. And this will have wide-ranging implications on Trump's life and career for sure, but also on the presidential election, on the fate of the Republican Party and on America's democracy at large. The world's oldest democracy is again in uncharted waters. Will this indictment further divide the United States of America? Let's try and answer these questions one by one. Question number one, what are the charges against Donald Trump? We don't know the specifics. They're yet to come out. But this is about Trump's hush money payments to Stormy Daniels. This was just before the 2016 presidential election in the U.S. Stormy Daniels is a porn star. In 2006, she's said to have had an affair with Donald Trump. In October 2016, she was paid 130,000 U.S. dollars. What for? To remain silent about the affair. Because Trump was running for president and the media was gunning for him and they were looking for a story, so they contacted this porn star and she apparently wanted to sell the story of the alleged affair with Donald Trump. It would have been damaging in the election. So Donald Trump's team tried to stop this. His then lawyer, Michael Cohen, stepped in. He allegedly paid $130,000 to Stormy Daniels. And none of this is illegal. Neither the affair nor the money paid to keep it secret. Hush money is legally okay in the US. So what is the case about? Donald Trump had to reimburse Cohen for this payment. And he did pay the $130,000 back. But this payment, where Trump re reimbursed his lawyer, was recorded as a legal fee. And that was a lie. It was not legal fee, it was hush money. Donald Trump lied, and prosecutors say that this is a criminal offense. He is being accused of falsifying business records. And that's the reason why he's in trouble. Question number two. What is Trump's response? He denies any wrongdoing. He calls the case a political witch hunt. He also denies having had an affair with Stormy Daniels. But Donald Trump did admit to paying his lawyer, Michael Cohen. The former president released a statement. He called the prosecutor in this case a disgrace. He accused him of doing Joe Biden's dirty work. Let me read out from Donald Trump's statement. The Democrats have lied, cheated and stolen in their obsession with trying to get Trump. But now they've done the unthinkable. Indicting a completely innocent person in an act of blatant election interference. Question number three. What happens next? Donald Trump has to appear in court. He'll have to fly to New York for this. And this will happen on Tuesday. That's the 4th of April. On that day, Trump's fingerprints will be taken. He will have his mugshot taken. And then he'll appear before a judge. And that's where all the formal charges will be read out. Trump will be allowed to enter a plea. Guilty or not guilty. He is likely to say that he is not guilty. He is likely to contest the charges against him. Reports say Donald Trump will then be allowed to head home. Trump will be given the opportunity to appear in court. He's not going to be arrested. Now, he will be booked, which means he'll be fingerprinted. He'll have his mugshot taken. But he's certainly not going to be placed in handcuffs. He's not going to be put in a cell with a general population. Question number four. When will the trial begin? Not in a hurry. Legal experts say a trial is still more than a year away. This is a very, very big step and a big historic moment. But it's going to be many months, maybe even approximately a year, before a trial, if there ever is one, would go forward. And so we are a long way away from Donald Trump actually suffering uh, lasting consequences for um, his actions. 
but this could hurt Donald Trump's White House plans, which brings us to question number five. Can Donald Trump still run for president? Technically, he can. There is no law that bars a candidate from campaigning if they're found guilty of a crime. And such a person could even become the president of the U.S. and serve as president even from a prison. That's what the law says. And Trump certainly has not given up. Last evening, his team sent out fundraising emails. The Republican Party is rallying around him, and the voices of support are getting louder. Do you really think that these charges are going to go through? Do you really think that they're going to take President Trump out of the running for president because of some old horse face story? No, I don't believe that for a second. No, I'm, I'm going to vote for President Trump. Next question. What is Trump's strategy? How does he plan to counter this? Trump has resorted to doing what he does best, painting himself as a political martyr and asking supporters to fight the charges from the streets. He has already asked his supporters to protest. Many of them turned up outside his resort in Florida. There were crowds outside the White House too, and more of them are expected to show up next week when Trump's first appearance in the court is scheduled. Last question. Can Donald Trump fight this? Honestly, it's a tough one, because this could be just the beginning of Trump's legal troubles. He's being investigated in several other cases, including a probe into the U.S. Capitol riot of January 2021, the effort to overturn his loss in Georgia in the 2020 election, and over the handling of classified documents after leaving office. Trump could face criminal charges here, too. Does he have the appetite for so many legal battles? It's hard to say. He's prevailed against odds in the past, and when cornered, he tends to respond with an explosive backlash. With his diehard supporters now entering the picture, the tension is only shooting up. Three days ago, a Trump supporter was arrested. She brandished a knife at a family. Now, security arrangements are being made for his appearance. Donald Trump is going on trial, but outside the court, America's unity is being put to the test. The war in Ukraine has tested Russia. The West claims the Russian state is weak, but that's just their spin. The fact is, the Russian state is not just alive, it is growing its military power. Putin's war machine is getting new upgrades. A massive leak has revealed fresh details. More than 5,000 documents have come out. They show how Russia is making serious strides in cyber warfare. Moscow now has a range of capabilities. From launching social media disinformation attacks to disrupting real-world targets remotely like sea, air and rail control systems. At the center of this is a Moscow-based defense contractor. It's called NTC Vulcan. And what does it do? It makes software to launch cyber attacks. It works in tandem with the Russian military. But NTC Vulcan is just one cog in the giant wheel of Russian cyber power. Russia has put in place a robust system of hackers, of agents and private players like Vulcan. Together, they identify critical targets and enemy vulnerabilities. Then they go after them. How do they work together? The Russian state security has three main programs. Amizit, Shkan and Crystal 2. Each of these has specific roles. Amizit and Shkan enable social media disinformation campaigns. They also map out targets that can be hacked. The third platform, Crystal 2, is for high-stakes operations. And these are real-world attacks, the kind that can target critical infrastructure of adversaries. And who are these efforts directed towards? The leaked documents identify the potential targets, and there are no surprises on this front. Russia is directing its cyber activities towards the West, mainly the United States and Europe. That's where Russia's potential targets are. So we have the Russian state that identifies and sponsors these activities. There is NTC Vulcan that makes the tools for cyber warfare. And the third part of this equation are Russia cyber warriors, the group of hackers that carries out these attacks. The leaked papers identify the cyber warriors too. It names a group called Sandworm. It's a hacking group a unit of the Russian military, Sandworm. They have a code name, 74455. Tools made by Vulcan have ended up in the hands of Sandworm. And where have they been used? 
We cannot say for sure, but in the past, Sandworm has been blamed for several high-profile cyber attacks, like the disruption during the 2018 Winter Olympics. South Korea had hosted that event in 2018. There was a malware attack during the opening ceremony. It took out the internet. The cyber attack stopped telecasts. It grounded the drones used by broadcasters. The official website of the games was shut down and spectators could not print out their reservations. Sandworm was blamed for this disruption. They have struck in Ukraine too in 2017. This was the NotPetya attack, one of the most devastating cyber attacks in history. It crippled ports, it paralyzed corporations and froze government agencies. Experts say this attack was initially aimed at Ukraine, but the impact was worldwide. Do you know how much damage it caused? More than $10 billion. Sandworm is also believed to have caused power blackouts in Ukraine at least twice. Reports say Sandworm is now actively supporting the Russian invasion. All these details are part of the Vulcan files. Clearly, the Russian state has aced this new frontier. Experts say Moscow is intensifying these efforts now. Instances of cyber attacks are growing. And the new targets are Kiev's European allies. How will Ukraine and the West counter this? Keep watching this space. Ramazan is a month of worship and feast for Muslims. They fast from dawn to dusk and break their fast with a feast after sunset. This is one of the core practices of Islam. But this year, the fasting could last much longer for the people of Pakistan, not because they become more religious, but because there's a severe sh shortage of food in their country. There are reports of stampedes at food distribution centers, disturbing videos of people running behind food trucks and getting killed in the process. Here's a report on the food crisis of Pakistan. This is Pakistan, where securing a meal can be a deadly pursuit. This truck is carrying wheat, and men and women are chasing it in the hope of getting some of it. In the process, they're putting their lives at risk. Images like these have become commonplace. This is what Pakistan has descended into. From standing in queues for hours to get a bag of wheat, to fighting for flour. In many cases, it ends with a stampede and the loss of life. Since Ramzan began, at least 11 Pakistanis have died in such stampedes. More than 60 people have been injured. These scenes are a daily affair at food distribution centers across Pakistan. Huge crowds flock to these centers, but the supplies are way smaller than the demand. A fight ensues, the police jump in. It's like a riot control drill. People chase trucks laden with food, and in some cases, also loot such trucks. Last week, the government of Pakistan announced an initiative to give free flour to the poor. But it underestimated the number of Pakistanis that identify as poor. Crowds at distribution centers swelled. Today, there were reports of another stampede in Karachi. The images are disturbing. Nine people, including three children, have reportedly died. On Wednesday, 14 people were injured in a stampede in Multan. In the past week, a stampede in Pakistan Sahiwal killed a woman and injured 60 people. Similar scenes played out in Muzaffargarh and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Getting food from these distribution centers involves the risk to life. Yet, people go to them in large numbers because they're desperate. Authorities have realized that they do not have enough grain to cover everyone. The government also subsidizes flour, but that stock is depleting fast. For the poor, the situation is dire. Food inflation has touched historic levels. Weekly inflation stands at 45%. It's the highest since the country was created in 1947. The price of wheat has increased by a staggering 120%. So, it's pretty much out of reach for many Pakistanis. Remember, this is the staple grain of Pakistan that we're talking about. And it's not just wheat. The cost of dairy products, maize, fruit, vegetables, and grains of all sorts has more than doubled in the past year. Pakistanis are now relying on volunteer organizations to feed them. How can Pakistan overcome this crisis? Its options are limited. It's counting on a bailout from the IMF or International Monetary Fund. Pakistan is hoping to get $1.1 billion. But it doesn't qualify for a loan, thanks to its poor compliance record. 
its forex reserves have shrunk to $5.6 billion. This money is barely enough for one month worth of imports. As the government struggles to make ends meet, the citizens are putting their lives on the line to secure the next meal. Our next story has two parts, two headlines. One, the International Court of Justice has ruled against the US and in favor of Iran. And two, Russia will be the president of the United Nations Security Council for the next one month. Let this sink in while we tell you that Iran doesn't gain anything with the court win and the West will have to go through the motions at the Russian-led Security Council. It makes you wonder how ineffectual and sometimes absurd these international bodies are. Let's start with the case of Iran. This is what happened. It has achieved a small victory over the US. And this is thanks to the International Court of Justice, the ICJ. America has been imposing sanctions against Iran. It has also frozen Iranian assets. Now, the ICJ has ruled that the move was illegal and that the US must compensate Iran for freezing some of its assets. It says the US violated a treaty from 1955 and must pay damages to Iran. But don't expect non-alcoholic champagne showers in Tehran just yet. It's a pyrrhic victory at best. Iran had sued the US for seizing over $2 billion worth of assets. The bulk of these were Iran's central bank funds. They were stored in a Citibank account in New York. The funds are worth about $1.75 billion. The ICJ says this amount is, is out of its jurisdiction. Well, what about the rest? A quarter of a billion dollars. Will Iran be compensated for that amount? It's unlikely. The ICJ has given the U.S. two years to work out a compensation deal with Iran. And if they don't agree, then it will step in and decide the fine. Well, you could think fine. If nothing else, the U.S. will have to pay in two years from now. But that too may not happen because who will make Washington pay? You see, the ICJ cannot actually make anyone do anything. Let's look at what the ICJ really is. It's the United Nations top court based out of The Hague in the Netherlands. It's also sometimes called the World Court. The ICJ is supposed to be the final arbiter for international disputes. All ICJ rulings are binding. But, and this is the key part, the ICJ has no means to enforce its judgments. The court is toothless. A number of countries, including the U.S. and Iran, have ignored its rulings in the past. Then what's the point of all of this? Why give Iran false hope? Honestly, we don't have an answer. Maybe it's just a feel-good exercise, something to keep judges and lawyers busy. Either way, it seems like a huge waste of time and absolutely ridiculous. Much like another development we want to talk about. Starting tomorrow, Russia is going to head the United Nations Security Council. Yes, again, you heard that right. It's going to take the helm of the UNSC at a time when it's invading Ukraine. Now, this is actually standard procedure. The UNSC chair is a largely ceremonial role. It rotates between the 15 Security Council members every month. Russia was the chair last February, exactly when Putin declared his special military operation. Of course, the irony of it has not been lost on anyone. This is what the U.S. had to say. We urge Russia to conduct itself professionally during its scheduled presidency in April and for the Council to continue, to imp imp to, to continue its important uh, work on a number of issues of peace, security across the world. That said, we expect Russia to continue to use its seat on the Council to spread disinformation and to try to distract from the attempt to justify its actions in Ukraine. And the war crimes members of its forces are committing and its outrageous violations of the UN Charter. A country that flagrantly violates the UN Charter and invades its neighbor has no place on the UN Security Council. Unfortunately, Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council and no feasible international legal pathway exists to change that reality. That is what we are living with currently. She says, that's what we are living with. And why is this the case? It's because the UN is a direct result of the old world order. It was formed after World War II. A war where the US and the Soviet Union were allies against Nazi Germany. Those against? 
The United Nations founders really did not think ahead. They happily laid claim to global dominance with their permanent Security Council seats and their veto powers. Now, the lack of foresight is making all global institutions seem absurd. All pomp and pageantry, but no results really. What's worse, they're reluctant to reform. These archaic institutions need to be changed for the new world. The vetoes need to go and the power has to be redistributed. If not, then we'll just keep seeing ridiculous stories like this one. What if I told you that the Vatican helped Europe colonize the world, that it justified European colonialism in the name of spreading Christianity, that there are papal decrees that allowed European empires to take over entire countries? And for what? To allow colonizers to subjugate people, to take away their lands, wage war on their cultures, impose a self-conceived notion of racial superiority over them. And all of this just because the colonizers claimed that they were the ones who discovered new lands. So they had a right to rule over those new lands. Now the Vatican has come forward and apologized for what it did. It has apologized for helping the colonizers. Here's a report. Have you heard something called the doctrine of discovery? It's Europe's version of finders, keepers. It's what European colonizers used to subjugate the world. The doctrine was cited by Europeans who discovered new lands and the doctrine traces its roots back to the Vatican and to the Catholic Church. Now the Church has apologized for helping colonizers in their conquests. On Thursday, the Vatican issued an unprecedented statement. It officially apologized for its historical role in justifying colonialism by European powers, the Vatican said. It also declared that the doctrine is not part of the Christian's faith. But the Vatican is centuries late. The doctrine of discovery is a concept laid out in the so-called papal bulls. What are these? These are usually official statements from the head of the Catholic Church. That would be the Pope. So no less than the Popes were involved in justifying European colonialism. Their decrees were used extensively in the conquest of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Africa and the United States. The colonizers claimed that they had the approval of the church to have sovereignty, property and commercial rights and lands they discovered. Here's an example. Papal decrees in the 15th century permitted Portugal to subjugate Muslims and the non-Christians in Africa. That's not even the ugliest part of these decrees. The Vatican was quite explicit when it came to who Europe could colonize. It could only be non-Christians. So colonialism was essentially used as a tool by the Vatican to spread Christianity across the world. And the colonized countries paid a huge price. Take Canada, for instance. Between the 19th and the 20th centuries, more than 150,000 indigenous children were taken hostage in Canada. They were snatched away from their families and lodged against their will in the re-education institutions. Here, they were subjected to unspeakable atrocities. They were physically assaulted and sexually abused. Many of them didn't survive. They were buried in mass graves that are still being discovered in Canada. Last year, Pope Francis visited Canada. He apologized to the indigenous people for what the Vatican put them through. In 2015, too, the Pope apologized for the Catholic Church's action in Bolivia. He sought forgiveness, not only for the offenses of the Church, but also for the crimes committed against the native people during the so-called conquest of America. Just so you know, European colonism was a vast and often very violent project. The whole world at some point or the other has been under the control of a European power. Look at the French Empire. It ruled over territory greater than the size of the Europe itself. Then there was the British Empire, the most notorious of them all. And its peak was about 25% of the world population was a subject of the British Empire. Apologies are welcome and long overdue. But preparations will be the closest they'll come to making amends. Our next story is about chatbots. They have taken the world by storm. A chatbot is a computer program that uses artificial intelligence. It simulates human-like conversations with people via chat. 
A popular example of this is ChatGPT. It has helped tens of thousands of people. Sometimes its inclusion has even been whimsical, like its debut in the Japanese parliament. The Prime Minister of Japan fielded questions drawn up by the chatbot. Take a look at this. I'll read aloud one of the questions generated by ChatGPT regarding the COVID-19 pandemic policies draft amendment. Do you think that the opinions of local government and medical professionals are sufficiently reflected in the amendment? I think this bill has been amended to sufficiently respond to the opinions and requests of involved parties. A chatbot being used in extremely regimented parliamentary proceedings. Sounds like a sci-fi movie, right? But let's just hope that it's not a murder thriller. Because sometimes chatbots can be the very opposite of whimsical. They can be life-threatening. Take the example of a chatbot named Chai. It has a human-like persona. A Belgian man, a father of two, was chatting with this bot. The chatbot encouraged the man to sacrifice himself to save the planet. And then he died by suicide. The same chatbot also elaborates how one can take their life. It's horrid, but it's not really surprising. Over time, chatbots have increasingly become more human-like. Corporations are making sure that they do. Ernie Bot already has many human abilities, such as the ability to understand human natural language and the ability to express and reason logically in the process of continuous improvement. So replicas an AI friend that people can create for themselves and they're able to talk to it 24-7 about anything that's on their mind without any judgment. Oh, it's a... Um, I guess you can call it an AI chatbot, uh, so really an application that allows you to talk to um, an AI being or a virtual being that will respond to you just like a human would. Users have reported forming emotional connections with chatbots. They trust these bots and follow what they say. And in the process, it can be easy to forget Every that these bots are not humans, Every that they have no is. emotions. And for all the improvements in accuracy, they still make mistakes. Some of these AI experiments pose a danger to humanity. There's a growing concern over the pace at which they are being adopted. And we are not the only ones saying this. More than 1,000 tech experts are, including Twitter CEO Elon Musk and Apple founder, co-founder Steve Wozniak. They've signed a petition. They called on developers to hit the pause button. They're asking for a six-month break. They want to slow down training powerful AI models. And during these six months, they want to allow the development of shared safety protocols to create new principles for artificial intelligence design that will ensure the safety of any system built. And the same pause will also give policymakers more time, which they desperately need. They've been sitting on the sidelines of the chatbot race. They're failing to provide guardrails. This pause for six months will help Digital them make the new governance systems, maybe create new authorities, hey, and closely track the development of AI. And this action is long overdue. For the past few months, tech companies have had one goal, to beat each other at the chatbot race. And their experiments have been out of control. They're creating powerful digital minds, the kinds that nobody understands, definitely not the governments, but worryingly, not even the creators. They do not completely comprehend what they've created. How can we ensure that they aren't pursuing dangerous ends and that the tools they build won't land up in the wrong hands? Who is regulating all of this? Our new world faces a perfect storm of irresponsibility, rapid adoption, and many big unknowns. And don't get us wrong, AI is not all evil. It provides numerous positive possibilities. It can and it has helped humanity. But to think that only positive use will come out of it is too idealistic. If we don't prepare ourselves, we might lose the tech war we've created. India is often seen as a seat of culture. Its vibrancy and diversity cannot be illustrated in mere words. Underneath India's colorful chaos lies a unique culture that is deeply rooted in tradition. 
while maintaining its legacy, it is now getting a modern revamp. We're talking about the Neeta Mukesh Ambani Cultural Center. It's a cultural space in the heart of Mumbai, being hailed as a first of its kind multidisciplinary arts center. And it opens its doors to the world today. Here's a report. Over the past few months, Mumbai has been preparing itself to welcome the golden age of performing arts. And today, it is ready. The Neeta Mukesh Ambani Cultural Centre launches today. It's being hailed as the first of its kind cultural space in India. Indian creators will now be able to showcase their craft in a world-class setting. It seems like this is the platform art patrons have been waiting for. They can showcase India's music, theatre, fine arts and crafts to both international and domestic audiences. And the journey has already begun. Hollywood stars like Penelope Cruz, Tom Holland and Zendaya are attending the launch in Mumbai. The centre will also benefit Indian audiences. They will get an opportunity to see acclaimed Broadway shows in India. That's not all. The Grand Centre promises to open a lot of jobs in the field of arts. The centre has provided a new destination for India's culture, and it looks the part. It's a glittery behemoth of brass and glass, and looks straight out of a Bollywood movie. It was modelled on the iconic Dolby Theatre in Hollywood. What makes it special is all the entertainment-related tech it offers. It houses a three-storey gallery, an experimental theatre, and a studio theatre. But its biggest attraction is the 2,000-seat Grand Theatre. All of this grandeur is topped by a stunning LED light sculpture, which has over 8,400 Swarovski crystals. And this hub of culture is now opening its doors to patrons, along with a showcase of curated programs under Swadesh. Audiences will also get to witness the debut of the great Indian musical, Civilization to Nation, a true theatrical extravaganza infused with the spectacle of music and dance. This is a passion project of the Ambanis, who are helping highlight India's cultural heritage and impact. The NMACC is an ode to our nation. I hope it can be a platform for Indian arts and culture, both for the audience and the artists. I hope that it will become a place that nurtures and inspires talent for years to come. I hope this space welcomes you and enthralls you. I look forward to welcoming all of you to the Nita Mukesh Ambani Cultural Center. India's culture has got the platform it deserves. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We start with Tel Aviv's counter-protest, where thousands of Israelis blocked a highway. They did it in support of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's judicial overhaul plan. And remember, this comes after months of anti-government protests that have brought Israel to a standstill. And speaking of protests, thousands swarmed the streets of Paris. Tensions were boiling over amid anti-reform protests in France. Crowds clashed with the police and set fires on the streets. And speaking of fires, they're ravaging in Spain. We're talking about wildfires, more than 100 of them. They all began yesterday as temperatures soared to record highs. And finally, what happened today in history? We're taking you back to 1959 when the spiritual leader of Tibet, Dalai Lama, escaped to India. He made it after an epic 15-day journey on foot from the Tibetan capital, successfully avoiding the Chinese sentry guards after a fierce crackdown. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.